Welcome back to another episode of the Anomalous Investor Podcast. Um, today we're going to talk about a very important topic, and that is the economic war that we're pretty much in right now with some emerging uh, nations. And this has been brewing for quite some time, but now we are relatively close to um, a lot of things changing as we know it, uh, life changing as we know it. And it, we're really going to get into some of the facts today and just kind of see what are going to be the consequences of a world where the U.S. dollar is not the reserve currency anymore and kind of what that means and what does that mean for our investments? Um, what can we do to make sure that we come out of this in the best way possible if this if this were to happen? And we're just going to really just dive into this because it's a lot of uh, things to unfold. So I'm going to try and put it in very simple terms so that we kind of grasp the concept and have a video for us to watch as well. Uh, so um, before I start adding like context and stuff like that, I'm going to play this video because it's going to give a good summary of where we are now roughly. So wait one sec. And this video is going to, it's, this video is going to explain uh, bricks and stuff like that and kind of, um, what it means as far as where we're to go into like hyperinflation and how this is going to um, emerge itself pretty much with uh, China leading the pack here. So let's go ahead and get into the video. I'm going to put an announce this week that Russia will begin using the Chinese yuan uh, to, for international payments instead of the dollar. Saudi Arabia is also in talks with Beijing to do the same thing. Speaking of Saudi Arabia, meanwhile, they are in talks uh, with Iran as well to consider an economic alliance with China and Russia. And they can even be joining the BRIC countries, which is an acronym for these countries here, Bra uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. These countries all have emerging economies. So what happens if our economy and the U.S. dollar are no longer the world's do dominant currency? Former Assistant Treasury Secretary and host of the Monica Crowley podcast, Monica Crowley, is here to weigh in. Monica, great to see you this morning. Uh, let's start right there. What happens if these emerging economies move away from the U.S. dollar towards the Chinese yuan? Well, good morning, Will. It's great to be with you. And it's really hard to overstate exactly how catastrophic the abandonment of the U.S. dollar would be. Uh, as the world's uh, global reserve currency. Look, since the end of World War II, the dollar has been the safe place to go, and it's been backed up by a couple of things. It originally was backed up by gold, but President Nixon took, took us off the gold standard, so there's no hard asset backing up the dollar anymore for the last 50 years. But also it's been backed up by the strength and economic power of the United States and the fact that oil has always been traded in dollars. If that were to end, that would mean the end of the U.S. dollar. Look, th there is a perfect storm happening right now, Will. The, the world's uh, reserve currency, being that, uh, having that status, has been a real privilege. But we've abused the privilege by wholly reckless monetary and fiscal policies over many years, certainly over the last couple of years, which has really devalued the dollar. On top of that, now you do have this perfect storm of Biden's weakness, his war on American domestic energy production, the Ukraine war. And as you point out, because of all of these things, we've got America's enemies led by China forming a new economic bloc. And all it would take at this point now, because we're at this pivotal moment, Will, mm -hmm. is for Saudi Arabia who has indicated that they're open to this, to say, you know what, we're going to be open to considering other currencies to trade in oil. If that were to happen, there would be a complete implosion of the global economic system, but certainly the American economic system. And if that were to happen, you'd be looking at sky high inflation, just raging Weimar Republic kind of inflation. If you think inflation is bad now, just wait. But more importantly, we would lose our economic dominance and we would right. lose our superpower status. Uh, Monica, the world's reserve currency said it's a privilege for the United States for the dollar to have been the world's currency. What how does that relate to each individual American? How has that changed or impacted or improved our lives throughout the last several decades? 
Yeah, I mean, it's given the United States incredible dominance um, in, in the world in terms of the economic system and in terms of trade. It's kept prices down. Mm. So whether it's energy prices, whether it's your food prices, the, the entire global economic system is reliant on the safe and secure dollar. But that is no longer true, again, because we've been printing money like crazy and devalued right. uh, the power of the dollar and the value of the dollar. But on top of it now, again, oil is the critical linchpin of this. If Saudi Arabia decides to join with America's enemies here and start trading oil in different currencies, that is going to undermine the entire global right. economic system. And here at home, you know what it's going to mean for us? It's going to mean raging inflation, so much worse than anything we have ever experienced will. Yeah. And I'll tell you, they're setting it up so that they can then come to the rescue by introducing central bank digital currencies. Right. If they were to do that, and the United States already has a pilot program, that means the loss of your individual economic freedom, because the government will have total access and control of everything you buy and sell and the ability to turn it off like wow. that. Ominous warning. I hear you. Saudi Arabia is the tipping point. Oil trading in dollars is the tipping point. Okay. A lot to unpack in that video. <laughs> A lot to unpack. So um, let's start with the uh, reserve currency in uh, Saudi Arabia. So pretty much uh, to kind of expand on that, what she means is that we would have a surplus of dollars running back to the United States. So when we have inflation, it's pretty much because we've printed, especially right now, we've printed a lot of currency. So think of it as a sponge and we have excess currency. So we have to absorb all that currency out there because our currency is technically debt and it has to be attached to uh, actual assets, right? So this is why we'll have things like a push up and food and real estate and uh, precious metals, things that are tangible, we'll see this absorption of the uh, this excess currency. And when it doesn't get absorbed fast enough, you'll see some, the Fed kind of step in like, like what they're doing right now. And they'll do what we call tightening, which is uh, raising rates and stuff like that to either slow down the economy if we are spending on uh, top of the inflation, which is kind of causing like a stagnation or kind of doing like the, the backups that we had with um, uh, supply chains and stuff like that, that we were having uh, about like, a year ago or so. And they'll, they'll do this to try and slow down the economy. But ultimately, it's just to absorb this excess currency that we have uh, in the market. And then you'll kind of slow down the economy once it's been absorbed. You'll see like some of the things like our record savings accounts and stuff that we had during COVID. You'll see those things kind of come down and you'll get closer to an equilibrium. But most of our currency is actually outside of the United States. So all that, the extra food stamp money, the PPP loans and the stimulus checks and stuff like that. That money is absolutely nothing compared to the amount of currency that's being traded internationally in things like oil, like with Saudi Arabia. But if we're talking about an abandonment of the dollar, all that currency comes back here. It's no longer being used. So we would then have to absorb all of that currency into our economy. So this is what you mean by she's saying sky high or raging inflation. The term for that is hyperinflation. And this is how you have things like the Zimbabwe notes. And it's, it was taking like a billion dollars to buy an egg and stuff like that. This, this is the, this is a very dangerous uh, tipping point here. And you do have two sides of the coin where, you know, you can have China push to come in and become the new um, glo global reserve currency or you can have the push for the dollar to come in, not the dollar, but the Fed to come in with their new crypto dollar and do this conversion. So there's a couple of things here that can dramatically change the system from what we've known so far. And this is very important for um, us to keep track of and ultimately prepare for it to go either way. You, you guys know, if you follow my channel, you know that I've been, um, I do invest in crypto. But I also invest in hard assets like gold and silver. I'm buying silver specifically since I was 15. I've been buying some gold and stuff as well. 
and it's really great because you don't need an uh, internet connection to uh, check your balance and stuff like that or to make the transaction. And of course, it has international value. Um, and, and it's, it's stapled to, it, it'll transfer as far as they're worth, whether that's Bitcoin, dollar, um, ruble, whatever currency is going on, it's going to have in value, uh, in that currency. And so, because you can't manipulate it like you can with the dollar and technically what she said about the United States abusing its uh, global reserve power, uh, is absolutely correct. You see, the China owns a lot of our debt. Um, you do things like these swaps with bonds and stuff like that with different banks. And typically, they'll settle up uh, at the end of the week if they're doing conversions and stuff like that. And typically, these conversions will take place where they'll convert back to a dollar. So even if you're buying our notes or our debt and stuff like that, or doing these swaps and things like with oil, all of that typically takes place in dollars or you will convert into a dollar at some point. But the problem is even when you're taking on our debt and you have to pay us back and you're converting the debt from either from our, you have to either keep it in our dollar or you convert it to your currency and then you have to convert it back to our dollar before you pay us back. But the problem is if it's like a, a five year note or something like that, we created, we printed more money and you see that. Okay. Well now I have to, it, 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 it's, it's, it's really just, I'll say this. If you have, um, if you're taking on this money and you're holding it and you have like a five year term, 10 year term and stuff like that, you're getting paid back with less valuable money. Right? So even if we borrow money and you say, okay, well it's fixed at a fixed rate and you have a certain amount of interest and stuff like that in there as well the price is not equal to the value. So a thousand dollars in 2015 is not going to have the same weight as a thousand dollars in 2025. And this is where a lot of the frustration that has taken place even globally when it comes to dealing with the dollar is because you'll say, okay, we're taking on this money and stuff like that. And they keep printing more and more and more. And this is why you try, they try and have to like systems say, okay, well, we're going to like uh, China say, okay, we're going to peg our currency to the dollar so that we can kind of get um, a decent exchange rate, stuff like that. So it's now floating around. And the, the other issue is when we have in uh, tightening and the dollar gets really strong, now they're having to pay more to convert back into the dollar or to do things like trade. So and the, it, it comes with a lot of advantages being the global um, reserve currency, but the recklessness that we've had um, certainly in the last, I'll say decade or so, um, it, it's really kind of rocked the boat here tremendously. And we're seeing the shock waves of it. Uh, we pretty much started printing money in 2008 and we stopped last year. Um, and this is the reason we've had this historic stock market run and all that kind of good stuff is we're injecting money over a hundred billion dollars a month for over a decade, um, mortgage backed securities and all that kind of good stuff. Um, and, and when you look at this and say, okay, we stopped printing money in March or April of last year, we have barely made it 12 months and we're doing bailouts and injections. So we're even trying to get to, like, if you look at SPY and stuff like that, we pretty much trended sideways for the last year. We're literally searching for an equilibrium or what the market actually looks like without steroids. And we're already seeing this shaking or crumbling here at the base because we've made the habit of these bad practices and dealing with not only our monetary policies, but also with banks and businesses. AKA the too big to fail uh, syndrome. You it, it's this, this is all coupled together as far as for why we're seeing this push here. Yes. I understand it's, you know, politics and politically motivated and they've been waiting for an, an opportune, opportune time to strike, to get us to pivot the rest of the world away from the dollar. I understand all that kind of good stuff, but we also have to say, okay, well, there are some things that have been overlooked on our part as well. And the, the biggest thing that we should be doing now, I'm not sure if Biden or Congress or whatever is working with Saudi Arabia, but Saudi Arabia is 
probably the biggest piece to that puzzle in the video you just watched. That can turn the tide relatively quickly here. Oil, that those transactions and stuff like that for those barrels, that is where the bulk of our money goes. I know people get mad about you know sending money to foreign countries and dumping money into Ukraine and stuff like that. There's there's reasons for that as well. Because again, our dollar is debt. If we keep it here, it has to be absorbed. So when you're dumping money out there and stuff like that, whether that can be to whatever country, um, you're offloading uh, the money and you're having it circulate. The dollar has to run. It has to be attached to a tangible asset. That's why on a micro scale, kind of we're talking about international affairs on a micro scale. That's why if we stop buying homes or taking out loans for cars and stuff like that, AKA if we stop getting into debt, what do they call that? They say that we're in a recession. The growth of our economy is directly attached to our ability and our willingness to go into debt, whether that be for real estate, uh, education, student loans, all that kind of good stuff. All of this is to offload the currency and attach it to an asset, put interest on it, then boom, okay, you offloaded that, it just cycle, the wheel keeps spinning. But when you have a slowdown in that, you have the cash piling up and it has to be attached to something. And this, and that, this is, that's kind of a, a micro way that you can, it, the same thing applies internationally, but it's just, they're spending billions and trillions of dollars, um, whether that be on like the war in Iraq or sending money to Ukraine and stuff like that. This is a way to kind of get rid of some of that excess cash. So it looks good politically to say, oh yeah, you know, we have to out such and such, or we're doing this here for the country and stuff like that. But there's also a benefit to, um, offloading that money as well so um it, it's it's really just a um i'm not gonna say a circus but it's it's really just been a uh, a very interesting decade and this is really unfolding relatively quickly here and congress and biden they should be working very closely with saudi arabia to make sure that uh, this agreement with BRICS does not happen because china has been waiting on this for a long time um Russia is very frustrated with the United States because of the Ukraine situation. And the, you know, this is what some of the conversations you hear about them being pushed toward um, China and this partnership. So um, it, it, this is what you hear about when people say, oh, okay, well, they're kind of pushing them together or pushing them into an alliance. So this is, this is really the case because you'll say, you know what, an enemy of an enemy is what a friend. So. And really outside of this, because even if they do try and strip the uh, U.S. directly of global reserve currency and stuff like that, outside of economic war, that does put us in position possibly for um, an actual war. And certainly that would be uh, World War Three, just because the nation's involved. So that alliance between Brazil, South Africa, India, Russia, China, all that kind of gets the, that alliance also strengthens them military wise. So it's like their version of NATO almost. So th this can, it, it's, it, it, it really just kind of makes sure that, okay, well, I'm not saying it this will go to like a nuclear situation, but it really just says that this can get really nasty in terms of economics because what is the U S doing to Russia right now? They're doing sanctions. So this is really just a pushback. And really, I'm not going to say encouraging this partnership with with uh, with China, but at this point, if you're Russia, you don't have a reason not to. So um, what we need to do uh, for the most part is because it's a look at the history as far as what has happened in these situations. What she said in the video about Richard Nixon taking us off the gold standard in 1971. That is absolutely correct. Um, we removed this from the gold standard. Our dollar would have been pegged. Um, and if you look at things like silver eagles, gold eagles, you'll see that they have, they're technically still pegged as far as for the redeemed amount, but the currency limitations aren't pegged as far as for how much currency we can have. That's at the free will of the fed based off of what they think we need, whether that be, um, even though we're the global reserve currency, the fed doesn't have to check in with Europe or uh, anyone that's using the dollar before they create money. When, when COVID hit, everybody just was printing money. It was good to go. Nobody checks in with the amounts. It was just, you know, we think this is good. This will kind of help. 
and everything was great. When it comes time to pay it back, of course, there's finger pointing and stuff like that. And the gold standard was something to prevent that. It provided stability and it provided the um, strength of the overall currency. If you, really, it doesn't matter how old you are. If you go talk to your grandparents, they'll tell you what the prices were of things a long time ago. Like when, when they were kids, they'll say, oh, a, gal a gas was 25 cents a gallon and stuff like that. That's not necessarily the price of gas increasing. That's what I meant earlier about the whole difference between price and value. This is the dollar also getting weaker. So you have, um, and you can measure this in real time assets saying that, okay, if you hold a dollar, technically you're getting poor, but if you're holding things like, uh, that has a, a limited value, let's say like, uh, a, well, a limited amount, like, you know, real estate or a gold, silver, Bitcoin, things like that, you're going to see this cross action where dollars going down and these assets are going up. And that's not just simply because they're appreciating. That's also because it's just going to take more dollars to buy them because the price is going up, but the price is not only going up, but the, the value is as well. Value is going to be what you get for your price. I'm sure you've seen the little basket analogy saying $20 would have got you this much groceries in like 1980 compared to, you know, $20 today. It gets you like two items. So this is one of the things that we have to do is make sure that we're hedging. And I do believe that, um, most of you, I know most of you are investors and I do believe it is in your best interest to, um, own some gold and silver, physical gold and silver, not the ETFs, not the, uh, put it in your IRA and all this crap here. And they're doing, you know, you know the paper assets and they're doing all the little funny business and stuff like that physical gold and silver that you can hold. And I'm not getting uh, paid for this or anything like that. Um, I used, I've used companies like Apmex, American Precious Metal Exchange and JM Bullion. I personally used them. I have not had any issues. Um, I've had my orders checked out that I've gotten from them, have not had any issues. Um, I'm not gonna tell you what to get, it's completely up to you. But I think this is uh, very important to go forward here, um, and to have a percentage of that in your portfolio and not paper. Um, I know most of you do stocks or crypto and stuff like that, but you're going to need something that you can have that can't be manipulated. That if your power gets turned off and like she was saying that on like a, a digital currency and stuff like that, they have complete knowledge. They have complete control. They can see everything, but also they can hit a switch kind of like at the bank. And you know, your debit card stops working and you're screwed. So this physical, you can have it with you in a, in a vault, whatever your pocket, whatever you want to call it, but it's physical and it's not so easily accessible by anyone. And I think that it's more important now than ever to make sure that we, um, as investors are adding that to our portfolio. So, and, and really just keep in mind that we are. I don't want to say even in like a war, because you see the thing saying, oh, this is going to lead to World War Three and stuff like that. The economic war has already started, in my opinion. I believe we're already there and it's we're just kind of seeing it kind of the flame kind of uh, get air and, and just do like it's uh, expansion. Roughly, we'll see if it gets out of control or if it gets wild, um, wild or if they're able to kind of put it out. Um, but I, I believe the economic war has already taken place. And right now the, the game is already started and they're just kind of picking teams, right? It's kind of like you're playing basketball. You're saying, okay, I want him. I want him. And they're coming up with the plan. They're coming up with their battle plans and stuff like that. That's when I think of when I see China and Russia saying that, you know, things are about to change for the first time in a hundred years. And, um, they're speaking with diff these different countries and doing the recruiting and stuff like that. That that's that's strategy. That's you know that's strategy. They're they're literally laying out their battle plans here to um, dethrone the country. So I want us to be prepared for this um, as much as possible because hyperinflation, inf severe inflation, is no joke. And whether or not this leads to a war or economic war or um, a pivot to a digital currency and stuff like that. You have to be prepared for that because that transition is, is rough. And I, I don't want to, I'm not saying that I'm not doing like a doom and gloom thing and, 
you know, telling everyone to hide in bunkers and stuff. But I believe in facts, looking at the numbers, looking at history and stuff like that, this has happened to pretty much every economic power in existence. And if you can't pivot, and I'm not saying America can't pivot, um, because we obviously can, but what I'm saying is that pivot can be rough. And if we're not going to maintain our status as the global reserve currency and we do this pivot to this crypto dollar or whatever thing that they're trying to unroll in June, um, that period can be a little bit um, more rough if you're having pressure from international affairs trying to unload some of that excess currency and send it back here. So th that, that's really why I wanted to um, drive home is the fact that you need to be, in, in my opinion, again, not financial advice, but in my opinion, I think it makes a lot of sense to um, diversify into uh, physical metals, especially if you have not and not focus completely on the cash conversions because um, things, in, inflation, when inflation hits over a few months period, like it'll seem like it's going slow, but as we've seen over like the last six months, three, four months in, prices can look real different on everyday um, utensils. So, um, I know it's, I know it's not, um, sexy to say, you know, I'm holding gold and silver. I know you can't eat it, <laughs> you, but you can't eat stocks and stuff like that either. You can't eat crypto either, but it's, it's a little bit more accessible. So, uh, keep that in mind when you're uh, investing, uh, I still will be investing and taking advantage of these opportunities. And of course we'll be covering these in uh, different videos, but I felt like it was really important to, um, uh, address this topic here because this topic is one that's not going to go away. China has been trying to position themselves for this moment for quite some time. So um, I believe this is going to be a hot topic for uh, the near future. So uh, we'll be covering it here. Um, like subscribe to the channel. Obviously, if you want to hear more, subscribe to the podcast. If you're listening to uh, the audio and certainly um, welcome you to the family of the anomalous investor. If you want our strategies and stuff that we're working on weekly, I appreciate all of you and I will see you in the next one.